title. Uh, our first guest is... John has a radio show over on Republic Radio from 7 to 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. And his website is thelibertyman.com. Our scientist as well, Ann Morrison. Her website is homeland-defense for the number for you.com. Uh, John, what's the latest in the issues of martial law, earth changes, and the other areas that we talked about this morning? Any areas that you are either watchful of or new news going on or a new analysis of what's going happening? Well, here's the latest. This just came in in the last hour. Uh, between now and the end of today, Monday, uh, 120 semi-tractor trailer truckloads of equipment are leaving Fort Polk, Louisiana, headed to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. You know, I, I don't know why that would be. Uh, Fort Polk is 328 feet above sea level. Uh, Fort Bragg isn't really uh, any higher. In fact, it may be a little bit closer to sea level than uh, Fort Polk is. But um, that's the latest news, and it may have relevance to all well, If I remember, Fort Bragg is in the tide of... Uh, it, it, now, is, there, is there a war game going on, or um, what... what, uh, what it would have to be a rather extraordinary what do you war game. It is? Um, if they were going to, to get ready for World War III, they wouldn't. They would ship it directly to a, a, sea, a, a deep water port, not to the, uh, Fort Bragg, which is uh, a, about 100 miles or more from the nearest deep water port. So uh, I really am at a loss as to uh, why they're moving yeah. this much equipment. It's it's a huge amount of equipment to say the least. Okay, what, uh, let, let's see if we can do a, a logical analysis. What kind? Of, what is the nature of the equipment that they're moving? Well, I, I don't know that. My source is uh, just reporting what's going on in the trucking industry. He's in the trucking industry, and they have orders to uh, report to Fort Bragg, load up this 120 semi-tractor trailer loads, and move it. Um, and that's as much as I know. Oh, okay. Now, what do you know about Fort Bragg in terms of what I, I, I know that Fort Bragg is tied directly in with uh, the School of the Americas, with a number of training of uh, various groups in South America. Um, if, if I was going to speculate, and I'm just going to speculate now, there's a tie between Fort Bragg and the various operational groups of special forces that operate right. and train the, the uh, various groups in uh, Nicaragua and elsewhere. And I right. think there'd be some kind of linkage like that. In other words, a preparation for a possible war or activity of some kind of special ops occurring in South America would be my first guess. Well, that's a possibility, but uh, and there is, keep sense? in mind, right, right next to Fort Bragg is Fort Polk, and there is heavy airlift capability at Fort Polk, which is immediately next door to Fort Bragg. So that, that would be, a, if they're doing air, so they air operations, to there and, yeah, that one of the things that's... Area. <sighs> Fort Bragg would be a good staging area. Yeah, for they can move it anywhere. Now they're, they're doing a, 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 a they're doing a war game between uh, America's Air Force and Israel and the ground forces, but there's not full. Inter there's doing a uh, integration of uh, uh, a war game between Israel and America. Uh, what do you know about that in terms of what's happening there? Because I heard they're patting each other on the back of how great this is, but we know that the Israelis. And will not and have not over five decades integrated their military, air force, and intelligence with ours. So, in a sense, we're operating by the seat of our pants when we deal with the Israelis, even though we do war games and call them our best ally in the region. Well, uh, the, so what do you think, John? Real, the, real, the reality of how accurate war games will predict performance is, I, I see, I see a complete big disconnect myself. Um, uh, you know, they do these things, they pat themselves on the back, but the, as soon as the first shot well, is fired, yeah, yeah. all that goes out the window. I'm sure the Polish Army was patting themselves on the One of the things the they did yesterday is they announced and they were kind of very... Hello. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they, there was a big uh, missile missile test uh, that occurred yesterday. Uh, I guess our phone connection is not very good. But our big missile test yesterday, John. Can you comment on that missile test uh, by our U.S. military because they knocked out four out of five missiles with their testing? Well, uh, uh, congratulations for knocking four out of five, but uh, all it takes is one out of five to uh, ruin your whole day. So. <laughs> um, and the, our adversary yeah, exactly. That's a good one. Uh, the, remember, I mentioned well, this analogy before about the. Uh, 
our potential adversaries all know what our capabilities are, and their their, their strategy is quite simple. That's simply to overwhelm our our defenses and uh, shoot twice as many missiles as we have capability of shooting down. Right. In other words, time. the Russians or or ways of evading them, like the new Topol M missile from Russia. Uh, in other words, they basically develop technology that nullifies even the, our forward placement of our missile defense systems, like in Poland and Czech Republic and elsewhere. Um, exactly. It's a simple. It's a simple strategy. Because I think that the Russians see these uh, de deployment. Yeah. Uh, the Russians, it's I think, simple. they see the deployment as basically a move toward a first strike offensive against Russia. Yeah. Well, uh, the, given their history, I, w I would. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not surprised that they have that concern. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a simple strategy. They simply yeah, determine no, um, how many... John, what else many, is happening that you see? Go ahead. You still there? Uh, is there also any possibility that of an October surprise uh, coming up uh, this year? Surprise uh, coming up uh, this year? Uh, before the election because of the head-to-head head and head, uh, conflict and of course uh, the the fact that Obama will do almost anything in his supporters to get reelected now they're toting the the, uh, uh, the Electoral College is thinking they're going to squeak by and get Ohio and maybe Pennsylvania so they're going to get elected even though they probably are losing the popular vote um, any word on a October surprise and what do you think it might be well I don't have any definitive word that one will happen uh, we're still basically on standby with our ear to the ground, uh, waiting to see if there would be an October surprise. And, and um, uh, you're right, the, the people that are behind Obama, they will do whatever it takes, in, including setting off uh, what, large bombs in cities, uh, an economic collapse, whatever it takes to keep their man in the Oval Office. Exactly, yeah. Now, uh I hear an awful lot of people kind of not realizing the consequences. I hear a lot of people saying, well, you know, vote for whoever you can, uh, you know, or don't vote at all because you have the two, two equal uh, uh, evil options. And I think that that is very counterproductive. Uh, I think that... I, so I wonder if you can comment on that, because I, I personally feel that if we don't vote for Romney, we're going to get Obama. And I, I use the analogy of if you get Obama, it's like a stroke and a heart attack, and you'll be dead uh, tomorrow. Uh, and if you get uh, Romney, and we don't know exactly the full quantity of what he's going to be, it's going to be a, an early diagnosis of it might be cancer, but you're probably going to survive if you get early treatment, maybe natural treatment, or survive uh, even conventional therapy. Uh, but with with Obama, all, everything is loaded to ready to go, isn't it? You've got the right. National oh, Defense Authorization Act, the fusion centers. You got everything operational, and we know a second term of Obama, like Dinesh D'Souza's documentary, and the documentary that from Jill Goldberg that talks about dreams of my real father. If you look at the uh, all the issues that have been laid out on the table, now we know that Obama is now a known quantity. It will be unbelievable. A second term, as I said, will resemble the first term of Vladimir Lenin. Well, I couldn't agree more, and uh, I think your analogy of, of, uh, of the uh, health analogy is a, is a good and a viable one. Um, I don't care particularly for Mitt Romney uh, one way or the other, but uh, it may give us some breathing space and maybe a chance to do some things we couldn't otherwise. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In other words, that's why it may be an early diagnosis of cancer, but you'll probably survive if you get proper intervention. <laughs> right. Well, the likelihood of their... Of the, uh, and of the uh, you're there. Do you have any comments on... on... I, don't know. I don't think Ann's here with us. Yeah, continue, John. You have another 30 seconds. I'm here. Okay. Um... <laughs> I, I can hear her say, yes, she is there. So we'll, have her, we'll hopefully get a better connection here in the next segment, so... We'll be back in just a moment with more of our special panel. We have Ann Morrison here as well. John, I want you to kind of complete any thoughts you might have. Uh, last thing, we had a little uh, sound trouble issues, but I think we've got that fixed now. Uh, any, any closing comments before we go to Ann and some of the major stories she's following? 
Well, I, I believe people need to, to keep their ear close to the ground and uh, be aware it's a fast-changing world. So, yeah, that, yeah fast-changing. In other words, be, be prepared as forewarned, and uh, better be prepared a year early than a day late. That's definitely Absolutely. for sure. Yeah, and I would say that the most probable uh, things are likely to happen in the near future, depending on who gets elected. If we have Obama, where they already the stock market says it's going to crash, uh, I think that uh, we're likely to have to have a real problem this coming January if we don't have a Republican president and a Republican Congress that can deal with the fiscal cliff. If we have Obama and a Republican Congress, we are going to hit the fiscal cliff, which is going to pull $600 billion from the uh, economy. Uh, we are going to deal with a down regulation of our military that's going to cause a major disaster with the what's called the uh, reduction of another $500 billion to the military that's going to cause a catastrophe there. <coughs> so we're likely to be stuck in terms of military preparedness to deal with military issues because we have an economic bottleneck there to supply money for the military for ongoing operations, which is dangerous. Uh, I think, in other words, I don't think the regular public understands that uh, the Obama administration are incompetent, stupid, and dangerous. And they're going to put the middle class and the nation in danger if we don't uh, move forward. We also don't have protection against our things that will damage the, the power grid. Our food supply, we don't have a national food supply, uh, you know, like we did to the early 1980s. We talked about this before. Uh, and can you give us the latest of the stories you're following? Well, I'm following uh, the storm, of course, and that would be uh, Sandy. Sandy, yeah. Yeah, it looks like it's uh, heading into New Jersey, and they're not sure how far west it will come. Now, normally storms move from west to east, and uh, this one is caught between a high-pressure area over uh, Greenland, and so, it, you know, the winds around the high-pressure area go clockwise, and so it's pushing this low pressure area, which goes counterclockwise back towards the United States. And it looks like it might uh, reach as far as um, Chicago, as far as the winds go. Right. And maybe some wind and uh, rain, and uh, the rain would be snow because they're having cold temperatures up in Chicago. So we may see it. I mean, it's a huge storm. And it said, they say that this cold front that just went through St. Louis last night is going to join up with it and make it a mega storm. And um, we were talking, it looks like it's going to turn west where the, uh, where the Gulf Stream stops. The Gulf Stream now doesn't get, make it all the way up to Greenland. The salinity pump at the, uh, at the southern point of Greenland has moved south to uh, offshore uh, the North Carolina banks. And it looks like that's where it's going to turn west. So, in other words, we're looking at probably a Frankenstorm because it's Halloween weekend coming up. Well, and they're calling, uh, it, they're calling it a Frankenstorm because it's uh, associated with Halloween, but it's going to be a mega storm. Right. No matter, you know, even if it weren't Halloween. Now, we have a number of other stories you're following closely. The one with uh, Louisiana with the sinkholes and the butane uh, deposits and the toxic waste deposits. There's also. Um, uh, a lot of methane being released in some other areas. I want you to talk about what this is, what are the earth changes occurring, and what's the danger to the people in Louisiana? Well, the, um, the aquifer that sits below the salt dome actually goes up as far uh, north as Fort as uh, Camp Minden. And if you remember about 10 days ago, Fort Minden, uh, Camp Minden had two explosions in its bunkers. And they, they, there were reported meteors in the uh, sky at that time that were coming down over uh, Camp Minden. And the thought is, oh, and in this aquifer, the uh, methane levels are very high. If they get much higher, if they get up to 85 pounds per square inch, then the um, aquifer itself, the methane in the aquifer, would break through the clay cap that's over the aquifer. And they think that the methane is uh, seeping out into the, into the river there because uh, Camp Minden is right on the, the river. And they think what happened was that enough methane was in the air that um, that the meteors or the meteorites caused a spark and set off the methane, and that's what blew up two of the bunkers at Camp Minden. Now the, wow. The so aquifer, in other words, this wasn't incompetent uh, handling of munitions. It was actually a meteor interacting with the methane uh, released from uh, the bowels of the earth. Yes, and they're now just reporting on the methane 
saturation in the aquifer. Now, they're not saying where the methane is coming from, but it could be coming from a migration channel uh, five miles below that, which uh, BP tried to tap into. There's a possibility that the uh, methane has seeped up now into that aquifer, and it's continuing. I mean, the pressure is rising, and, and uh, the environmentalists and the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, are watching it very closely. Of course, the citizens down there don't think they're watching it closely enough because they haven't uh, given them payments to move out of the area, but I think I would self-evacuate if I were any cl- anywhere close to the sinkhole. They, they, right. they, they, they think that um, from their observations that the sinkhole was caused by the sidewall collapse of the salt dome of the um, Texas Brine Cavern. So it wasn't from the top, it was the sidewall collapse. And uh, they've cleaned up most of the debris now, but they still have a lot of oil residue in the sinkhole. And, of course, the water is very it's brinish. It's brine water. It's not salt water or, or fresh water. It's brine because it's in the salt dome. The salt, salt dome is uh, deteriorating. And there's a real possibility that with this methane leaking, if it leaks up into there, and they already have some evidence that it is, that a spark would set off the methane, which would then set off the butane. And they've already had a butane flare. And if the butane uh, is set off, there's every possibility that it would follow the liquid butane down to its cavern and explode. And that would be a 10-mile radius explosion. So it would... uh, What other earth changes are occurring that you're keeping an eye on, too? We talked about this earlier this week with Professor McCanny on Wednesday, and we had Stan Deo on last week. Um, any, so, any space weather issues going on in near Earth objects? Anything else that's happening uh, in terms of the ozone layer, which is thinning, and the issue we talked about before the show today, peak oxygen? Uh, any analysis of anything going on that uh, needs attention? Yeah, well, we had an asteroid. We had a near Earth object that came into the atmosphere above San Francisco, and they're asking people to find the the remains of that, the meteorites that came down from that, and that was not that was not being tracked by JPL or NASA. Normally, we would get uh, forewarning about such a near-Earth object coming into the sky, especially one that was the size of an SUV. The um, the UV when the when the sun sets out a flare now, the, the UV that accompanies that flare is uh, coming down as far as ground level. And the last flare was a um, X 1.6. Now, it was not accompanied by a coronal mass ejection, but uh, it was accompanied by um, ultraviolet ionization. And apparently that affected southern China, Indonesia, and Australia. Now, again, those flares, if, when they come down, is they come down on the sunlit side of the Earth. And if they don't last too long, then uh, they won't. Uh, we were on the backside of the earth at that time so we weren't affected by it on this hemisphere but if they yeah if it's a number of hours too it can we we had that thought i want you to repeat that when we come back we're We're on break all that week come back and uh and you were saying some very important things right before the break and we want you to continue uh please continue on that Okay, well, we had a, uh, the, the strange thing was, before we had the X-flare, we had a, uh, we had a uh, M9 uh, flare, and that was when the uh, sunspot 1598 was just coming into the earth side of the, of the uh, uh, sun. And uh, what happened was that it lasted for seven and a half hours. Now, normally, there's four bands or intensities of radiation that come from the sun, and that goes B, and then the next uh, higher intensity is C. It's 100 times bigger than the B, and then 100 times bigger than the C is the M band, and then 100 times bigger than the M band is the X1 band, and 100 times bigger than the X1 band is the X2 band. We think the keratin event was an X54. So that gives you some some idea. We had, Uh I was... This, this flare that came in was a seven and a half hour long flare. Now, when you get a flare that's that long, so you have to look at intensity and duration. And um, when you get a flare that's 
coming in for seven and a half hours, that means that you might rotate onto the sunlit side of the earth while the flare is still coming at you. And so you could be exposed to ultraviolet radiation as you uh, in the morning, or you might be rotating out of uh, this. Uh, at sunset, you'd be rotating towards the dark side, so you might be exposed to it at sunset. So in other words, uh, we talked about this in the program, and you came up with some brilliant ideas. We should check space weather every day before we go out to see if there's a solar storm occurring. And then we should have a UV detector to see if the UV, or just go online and check to see what the, what the UV measurements are, because if they're starting to surge up, you, we could be being bathed with a lot of radiation coming in from a solar coronal mass ejection, uh, because, or, or not even necessarily a full CME, but a, a UV surge where you get strobing of the Earth with ultraviolet light. Well, I wish that the government were that were that detailed, but no, they stopped reporting UV levels um, at the end of the summer, so they no longer report them. And, and I was surprised. I've been collecting anecdotal evidence here in St. Louis, and there have been, you know, after the equinox. You mean they don't? Have, they don't tell you if it's eleven, twelve, or thirteen anymore. They don't tell you anymore. Oh, that's uh, they see. A cover-up is even better than the original story. The fact they won't report it anymore, and they have the technology to do so tells you that something really bad's happening and they don't want you to know. Well, I think that this was just traditional, that they never expected UV to strike the northern hemisphere when the sun was, uh, when the ecliptic of the sun was in the southern hemisphere. But I well, had anecdotal reports of people getting uh, sunburn from being outside when these flares strike. By the way, you can go to Les EMF, and they do have UV detectors over there. Uh, and uh, the uh, UVB detectors will also detect a higher energy UVC and D. If your UV light uh, index is going up, sorry, are you saying the weather services aren't reporting UV index anymore? But not for the winter, no. They've stopped reporting it. Damn. What do you think of that, John? I mean, have you had what I call one of those kind of like, oh, my God, moments, like I just had right now when you told me this, Ann? Have you? What do you think of that? All right. Well, I, I think they're trying to save electricity. <laughs> no, well, no I, I think what they're doing is they're just trying to make sure that the public stays sufficiently stupid and in uninformed so that when real disaster strikes, we have no preparation whatsoever from going outside and getting a pterygian, uh, or, which is a benign tumor to come across your eye, serious sunburn or immune system uh, depression caused by high energy UVC or a very bad sunburn we break out and blister all over our bodies. They don't want us to know these uh, kind of minor details about reality because it's better to keep us uh, like mushrooms, in stupid, fed BS, and kept in the dark. Well, I, I, the service I use is called IntelliCast, and they are reporting the UV index today for October 26. Oh, good. Okay, well, that's good. What are they reporting? So, uh, for the St. Louis area, uh, four. Yeah. Well... I don't know where they're getting their information. I don't think they're taking the sun into consideration. I mean, the sun flares. They're taking the sun into consideration and the location of it in the sky. But I don't think they're they're looking at flaring. Yeah, you're talking about space service, in other words. You're talking about the space service reporting ultraviolet light. Is that what you're saying? Right. Right. Yeah, now what we have is we have weather services are reported. What we need is a combination of space weather and ground-based weather services telling the public what's the characteristics of the frequency spectrum of the light. Is it dangerous to be what we call toxic sun? Is it also toxic to your plants, to the grassy plants, to the food-bearing plants, to the trees? Um, this is one of the things that I suspect is going to happen sometime in the next number of years is we're going to have a shock where you can't go outside for a period of time because it's dangerous to be out during the daytime. Uh, and I can't tell you when that's going to happen, but I see it coming with a magnetic field reversal on the on the way, a three million mile square uh, area in South Atlantic anomaly that isn't at ground level. But if it got at ground level at say Rio de Janeiro, it would kill everybody there. People don't understand these things are very real. They're not sci-fi mysteries. It's something that the scientists tell the astronauts when the space shuttle uh, goes through the or the space center goes through the South Atlantic anomaly. They even wrote jets around it so they won't have their instruments knocked out by the radiation coming back from background cosmic radiation. So people, when they say, oh, you guys are making that up, I said, go Google it yourself and become a Google genius. It's all out there. We, we just bring it all together and ask questions. And we have very limited data, and they want to make it more limited by not kind of telling us, is this uh, sunspot strobing us with ultraviolet light? That's pretty significant, isn't it? Well, I think that's one reason they built the underground bunkers is because they know that 
they're they're aware that the uh, stratosphere is thinning and that the ozone hole is disappearing. It didn't, you know, it used to be that the ozone hole was over the South Pole, and now it's over Greenland. And that has caused a Greenland high pressure system to set up. And um, so it's blocking the weather. We can expect this storm, the sandy storm, to uh, hold back our weather movement that is the uh, jet stream. It'll, it'll actually just It'll stop. It won't stop the jet stream, but the jet stream is going to buckle uh, because it can't move the storms. And so we're going to have this uh, continuing storm for the next, oh, once it gets into the Ohio Valley, it might last for two or three or four days. Right, so it could last long enough. It might even, uh, it might even get into the area where it's even kind of screws things up before the election. Well, it could. And if the power is still out, I don't know how the people are going to vote. That might be possible. If they were going to vote for Obama, that might be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, he's just, got, yeah, he's got let, the Northeast, doesn't he? Let, let, let's pray that all the Republican areas, yeah, their the streets are clear, the power is on, and they can get to the polling stations. And those who intend to vote for Obama... Forget it. I hope you have your propane in your tank and you have a, have a way of keeping your food from rotting. But we don't want you voting. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I told John two or three years ago that my worst fear would be if the jet stream actually stopped. Um, that would what do you think will happen? What do you think? It just mean the stationary storms will just sit down and stay there? Yes, and that's essentially what we're going to see over the next week. Oh, wow. That's why they're talking a Frankenstorm. Um No, I know that. Alexander Bachman, are you there? I don't think we have Alexander yet. The uh, situation in the next few months is uh, pretty precarious. We have Israel saying that they want to do a preemptive strike. Both Obama and Romney said they weren't going to do a U.S. military launch strike, but they both said they, quote, have Israel's back. Um, I think it's very probable that Israel will try to do something stupid, uh, hopefully after the election, but I think that they're likely to do it, and that America will be hauled into yet another conflict with the Strait of Hormuz closed. The Iranians have stated, their oil minister, that if there's any more sanctions against them, in the next few days or weeks they will close the strait and stop shipping their oil, but they'll also close their waters. My guess is they don't need to do any military action. All they have to do is make a public statement, and the insurance companies will close the Strait of Hormuz, which means no oil for you like the soup Nazis on Seinfeld. No oil for you. Um, when we come back... Uh, We'll uh, probably get an update from Alexander Bachman as well, and we'll be back in just a moment. Alexander Bachman. Uh, Alexander, we did an interview earlier in the week, and I guess you've edited it. It's over at alexanderbachman.com. I'll post up the link of that uh, audio interview. Um, besides that, it deals with a lot of spiritual issues and issues that really are the core of why we're having the geopolitical issues, why we're having this split of the nation between a candidate who shouldn't deserve any votes, which is Obama, and a candidate that we're nervous about, Romney, who might have promise, but we have to make sure we maintain sufficient choke chains because he's very variable. That's why we've called him in the past Flip Hananiah Romney. We have a, uh, they're not equivalent uh, two sides of the same coin, although some people say that. Uh, and we need also pray for these leaders because they're evildoers. They've done things in the past that really isn't acceptable, but I think that they're not at all equivalent. If we have Obama, the equivalent in terms of medical diagnosis is a stroke or heart attack and death by the morning. And with Romney, it may be an early diagnosis of something that might be cancer, but you probably are sur will survive with proper treatment and diagnosis. What we have is a situation, too, in terms of Mexico, that they're going to pull $500 million from the U.S. military. If Obama gets in, the fiscal cliff is going to happen. The stock market's already preparing for a crash-and-burn scenario if the idiot Obama gets in. 
Well, uh, we I, have the, the yeah. have the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton bowing out, and she had a very sour look on her face when they're making her fall on her sword, as if she's the only person involved with this deal with Benghazi. When Obama was directly involved in delaying operational activation of the military to get in there within an hour after the first strike, when there were waves uh, that hit Benghazi. Um, we have an incompetent government that doesn't know what the heck they're going to do next, and everything they touch just screws up. Like the, you know, downgrading our military, not maintaining our borders, uh, you know, literally backing up the Sinaloa cartel you mentioned last time. Uh, it's our government's so nuts and so stupid. It's just demonically crazy. Well, it's it's gonna it's it's showing it's showing it's showing it's gonna start reaping soon, and I believe that the negligence of the candidates uh, to mention the the border issue and the Mexican situation with this uh, failed uh, proxy drug war that the Calderon received help directly from Washington in order to. Uh, bring it upon Mexico with uh, creating 120,000 fatalities. It's just another example of the political incompetence in Washington. It doesn't matter who wins the election. The problem are the people higher up that give them and tell them what to do. Now, Obama is a clear and present threat to the entire world now. Okay, He's worse than Gaddafi. Okay, And people need to wake up to that reality. They cannot vote for this man uh, again on November 6th. But I also think that we're likely to see an October surprise where he may try to go after the 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 uh, Ansar al Sharia, the guys that he armed actually, uh, with the assistance, by the way, of this ambassador Stevens, to do a regime change and kill Muammar Gaddafi. Now we have 18 tribal groups fighting each other. Uh, then they try to apologize and assist State Department that, oh, I'm sorry, uh, what we're having now is. Uh, uh, a situation where we're sorry, but we gave arms to the wrong guys. I'm like, most of the guys you gave the arm to are the wrong guys. You shouldn't be doing regime change, thinking it's a good idea to get rid of Assad when he actually doesn't want to use these weapons, and replace them with people that will almost certainly try to use them against somebody like Israel, who will go crazy and try to nuke all these Islamic cities and precipitate World War III. So what Obama is doing is literally just laying the groundwork for the end of civilization. And that's what, uh, what you know, Linda LaRouche has said in his podcast, which he's going to do another one this evening. People need to see that. I think 8 o'clock Eastern time tonight. Um, but they can go to, to LaRouchePAC.com and see the uh, schedule there. Uh, I don't think people understand that this is far more dangerous than the Bay of Pigs. And now, as a military expert, you can probably comment on that, John. What do you think of this current situation? Because this is beyond hair-brained hair ideas that Obama has in the State Department. It's just craziness, isn't it? Well, it is absolutely crazy, and, and uh, the analogy to Bay of Pigs is very accurate. Uh, what's going on right now is at least as bad, if not worse, than what was going on with the Bay of Pigs. Yeah, I think they figured that originally that uh, they discovered through the latest document releases that there's, we're 149 uh, missiles uh, that could hit anywhere in the United States at the time back in the 60s. What we have now is deployed in these uh, multiple countries, including our missiles in Turkey, thousands of these missiles and warheads, uh, just ready and raring to go to attack uh, Russia. The same with Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan, which is armed to the teeth. What I heard on Wednesday, and I want you to comment on this uh, perhaps, John, is Professor McCanny uh, made the statement that all of the signatures that the tsunami was caused by artificially, it wasn't a P wave and other indications, it was a vortex of water, that this was a artificially created tsunami and that it was a response by the Israeli uh, government, the Israeli Mossad, to warnings to tell Japan to stop selling nuclear materials to Iran which we now know that the Fukushima plant was actually a nuclear weapons development plant doing uh, the MOX reactor building number three, MOX reactor pellets for plutonium detonators for nuclear weapons. So I think that right. they, it well, starts, it's well, starting well, to, well, after months, the, the, the smell test is starting to make sense. Well, Professor McCann, uses the scientific method. He looks at the evidence in front of him, and then he uh, analyzes the evidence to see what can cause uh, the results as opposed to jumping to conclusions. So uh, I, I have a lot of respect for Professor McCann's work, and, and uh, given the opportunity, I think that we will be able to prove his analysis correct. 
Yeah, I think he said that we're, he has an entire paper on it where he said we're going to discuss it next time he's on the show. But he mentioned a number of anomalies that he said no P wave indicating a regular earthquake to trigger the tsunami. None of the regular earthquake parameters that you'd actually expect to be seen on the uh, on the geological analysis, the data side, data streams that occurred at the time and uh, the people were sitting in the buildings in Sendai and in Fukushima and they were hit with a tsunami right out of the blue so if they'd had tsunami warnings because the best warning system and operational plan for emergencies is in Japan anywhere better than anywhere in the world so the fact they didn't know that a major superquake was coming uh and then with a P wave, which could have, you know, because it was 125 miles away, they would have sufficient time to get out of harm's way. They didn't. There were people driving around the, the roads with no warning, and you know they would have had an emergency broadcast system to say get at least three to five miles inland. Easy to do for a good part of the population, even if they only had a half an hour or 20 minutes. But you know, the tsunami would have taken a while to reach there, wouldn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and if it's true, it's a declaration of war because 22,000 and more people died that day in Japan. Right, but how many more people are going to die from the radiation effects in Japan? They told police they don't uh, reproduce for two years. They've uh, re polluted the area. Within uh, four days, 22 provinces in China declared that they found extreme levels of radiation coming into China. China's in danger. I, I would not be surprised at all if at some point if the international community doesn't step in, China decides to actually take a preemptive military action to say, we've got to come in here and invade this area to get control of the site because it's not just there. We, if we have future, future um, earthquakes occur along the solar area, including the refilling of the magma chamber of Mount Fuji, we're going to have a lot of other reactors go down. And these are going to be continued to with you know, 50, 60 years of, of stored radiation, a lot of them are enriched with plutonium because of their, their spent fuel rods. We're looking at a very dangerous situation. And here in North America, you know, they had that scare earlier in the week. I think that the scare needs a little proviso to say, look, uh, that was a cry wolf, but it wasn't exactly because we're certain that there was an explosion on site that, that lit fires in at least one or two places if they're non-contiguous because we're looking at satellite photos and I had uh, this reported yesterday with Chris it's very probable that they had a hydrogen fire because the corium is actually generating hydrogen and seeping up through the earth and igniting and blowing hot radioactive debris lighting the uh, long grasses around this Fukushima Daiichi plant this is not a cigarette blot drone this is very unlikely to be a lightning strike this is probably hot radioactive debris which means that the whole place because you got a 30 centimeter 0.8 meter subsidence of building four something's about to blow and they don't want us to know they have the muon uh, imaging technologies now for looking underground where the corium is and right after this all of a sudden this false story came out they also put in a false report in indian news trying to report something from a year and a half ago uh, this has all the smell test things of a PSYOP to try to, you know, burst the bubble that people will pay attention to Japan, think it's a real problem, and not listen to the alternative media when what we're saying is this disaster hasn't even got a head of steam on yet, and it's the worst environmental disaster in human history. It is the worst, and what's, uh, what's, the fact is that uh, all humanity has to wake up. Go to the interview at alexanderbachman.com and listen to the interview I had with Dr. Deal. It's very important. <coughs> I'd say, number one, repent, and number two, prepare. Your comments, John. Well, I agree with everything you're saying, gentlemen, and uh, everyone have a great, safe weekend. This is the Liberty Man signing off. Be better prepared this weekend than you were last, and may the, as they say, the ironic prayer, may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you and keep you another week, another day, another hour to do good in the name of the Most High God. Great lineup next week. We appreciate your support. Pray for us, and pray for the peace of America, Israel, and the world.